One of the fundamental questions to ask about the registered land system is why do we actually have it? Well, I think there are two main reasons. The first is certainty and the second is efficiency. A registered land system grants certainty because we know who owns which property and that guarantee comes from the state. Secondly, we also have efficiency as well because it means when two people are buying or selling a particular piece of property, then it makes the whole process a lot more efficient to have a registered land system. In other words, overall, the registered land system helps do the most to protect people's rights in relation to land. And so that's what we're going to examine today in this particular lecture. So with that in mind, let's get started with registered land. The main piece of legislation that we're going to be looking at in relation to registered land is the Land Registration Act 2002. And in accordance with Section 28.1 of that particular Act, the basic rule is that things operate on a first-come, first-served basis. However, this is mainly in anticipation of e-conveyancing. And so in the meantime, what we instead have is something called the Special Priority Rule, which priority, prioritises things that are actually on the land register. And so we, the best way to think about this is if someone is buying a piece of property, what could they actually be impacted by? Well, it could be a registered charge that we'll look at on the charges register. The main focus of this lecture today is going to be on um, a notice in the register. And the thing that we're going to be looking at in part two of this lecture is an unregistered interest that overrides registration. And so this is the basic functioning of the rule at the moment with that focus on what is actually on the land register itself. There are some interests, like a lease of less than seven years, that do not require registration but are still protected by this special priority rule. But we're going to be focusing mainly today on the things that are going into the register. So the charges register itself can include a number of things such as positive covenants. That's where it's telling someone to actively do something. It's like a promise to uh, do a particular action. And there can also be restrictive covenants as well, uh, and this is preventing people from taking certain actions, and this is all in relation to land. So an example of a restrictive covenant might be that you can't um, graze sheep on a particular piece of land. There can also be financial charges that go on the register. This is very common for things like mortgages, but any loan that's secured against the property will end up on the charges register. And the main focus of today's uh, lecture is going to be notices, and these can be unilateral, so put up by one person, or agreed, uh, which would be an agreement between the person putting the notice on the register and the actual owner of the property. So with that in mind, let's uh, go into this focus on notices then. So minor interests, which can be permanent or temporary, can only be protected by entering a notice into the register. And on this slide and the next slide as well, I've put some examples of uh, minor interests that can be protected by a notice. Um, you can look at these in further more detail if you want, um, but I've just put them up as examples for you to have a look at. So leases longer than three years, equitable easements, and also mortgage and, mortgages and charges, which are equitable as well. On the next slide, we have things like contracts to grant a lease and other types of contract. Um, freehold restrictive covenants and probably the most important one on this list is right at the bottom uh, these are the statutory rights of a spouse or a civil partner to occupation and that derives from the Family Law Act of 1996. There are some interests that cannot be protected by a notice in the register so we're looking here at things like beneficial interests under a trust of land Leasehold terms of less than three years, that's to avoid cluttering up the register with lots of different short-term leases. And also restrictive covenants that are between a lessor and a lessee. We're going to focus though mainly on things that are in the register itself. And anyone who has a claim um, for a notice that could go into the register can apply for a notice to be entered. But this doesn't necessarily mean that if you make a claim for a notice to go in, that it makes it valid. Um, so, for example, I could apply for a notice that I live and have a lease in relation to my neighbour's property. However, even if I was successful at getting that notice put in the register, 
that would still not be validated because I obviously don't live in my neighbor's house, I live in my own house. Um, so these notices, as we sort of said a little bit earlier, they can be agreed, which is the most common thing we use for uncontroversial um, types of notices that would go into the register. And these are generally agreed between the parties. However, there are unilateral notices as well. And this is where the um, entrance of a notice onto the register is often disputed. A person may decide to enter a notice into the register and that doesn't necessarily need proof. But the owner of the property can then look at that notice that's gone into the register and they themselves can apply to have that notice cancelled. The other thing that we have to think about when it comes to registration and notices is something called the registration rule. And this basically says that if you have a minor interest in a piece of property and you have the possibility to register that minor interest, then if you fail to do so, and the property later gets sold, then you have the possibility of losing that minor interest because you failed to register it. Now that can seem a little bit harsh, but think back right to the introduction to this lecture. We talked about the register being a source of certainty and efficiency. And so if you have a minor interest and you fail to register that minor interest, then it's your fault that the register doesn't reflect the actual reality of the situation in relation to that property. And so to a certain extent, it's quite fair that you should get punished for failing to enter into the register an interest that you have in that property. The final thing that we're going to talk about today in relation to registration and the entering of notices into the register is about fraud. And this might be a little bit surprising because the focus so far has been on achieving that certainty and efficiency of the register. And there hasn't been much place so far for thinking about morality. However, we're definitely going to be thinking about morality and society in the next lecture when we talk about unregistered interests that override. But we're gonna start off thinking about that in the context of the system of notices by talking about fraud. And so while the um, registration rule can mean that nice guys finish last, as Lord Roger said in Burnett's Trustee and Granger 2004, the law obviously has an interest in preventing fraud. And so they will operate in a moral sense in this particular way. And those of you who are a bit devious minded may have already thought of a few examples of how this particular system could be defrauded. But for those of you who are a little bit more honest, let's have a think about how this system of notices and registered land can be used to defraud. Firstly, imagine a situation when you are deliberately transferring a title because you know that someone has failed to register a minor interest. And so by transferring the land, you know that that person will lose that minor interest. Now, if this is being done fraudulently, then that is obviously uh, unfair and the courts may look at that disposition and override it. So the case there is Buttigieg and Mikulev. Uh, that's an unreported Australian case from 1998. But this was an example of where a property was sold because they knew that there was a minor interest that was unregistered and the parties wanted to get around that. In a similar sort of fashion, we can also have a promise made by a buyer that they are going to protect the unprotected rights of a third party who perhaps have an, have an unregistered minor interest in the land. But then they go back on that promise and they seek to say, oh, well, you've not registered your minor interest, therefore you don't have it. Obviously, that again is very unfair. And because a promise has been made in this regard, the courts can impose a constructive trust. And that was the solution that was used in Loki U and Port Sweeten and Rubber Company Limited from 1913. A constructive trust has also been used in other examples here. Here we have an example of a purchaser who takes title subject to unprotected minor interests and in particular has had their conscience touched. In other words, they're aware of the minor interests in a way and have taken the property aware of these minor interests, um, but are now seeking to undermine the interests themselves. 
So how can a person's conscience be affected in this particular way? Well, it could either be a, through a positive acknowledgement of the interest, so they said, yes, I'm aware that there are minor interests, um, or they could be uh, inferred by the context of the situation. So the court may decide that the buyer was aware from the context of the situation that there were unprotected minor interests, and so their conscience has been touched in that regard. And that was the situation in Ashburn and Stolt and Arnold from 1989. So let's think about what we're going to cover next time, but also what we've covered in this lecture. In other words, what we know is when a person buys a piece of registered land, they could be affected by something that is on the charges register and also something that is safeguarded by a notice in the register. What we're going to be looking at next time, though, is a lot more complicated because we're thinking about some interest that has not been registered at all, but can still override registration. And this may seem a little bit odd because our focus in this lecture has been about the importance of having interests registered and the register being a reflection of reality. So when we're talking next time about um, unregistered interests that can override registration, this seems to go against the idea of certainty and efficiency that we talked about at the start. Nevertheless, that's what we're going to try and look at next, uh, next time. And in the meantime, you might want to have a think about why an unregistered interest may take priority over something that is on the register. If this particular topic comes up as a, an essay question, then you'll want to focus on the certainty and efficiency of the land registration system. And also maybe think about the future and the possibility of e-conveyancing. How will that affect land registration when we move to the basic rule set out in section 28.1? If this comes up as a problem question, then you'll want to focus on the types of interest that can be entered into the land register. And so you'll want to get that distinction down so that you can see which interests do need registration and which interests are not capable of registration at all. Hope you enjoyed this lecture and that you'll tune in next time for part two when we'll cover overriding interests. In the meantime, any questions, leave those as a comment below. Like and subscribe so that you're aware when the next video comes up. And I look forward to seeing you then. That's all from me. Bye.